today we have a very special guest on the channel, Mike Blayback. Mike Blayback has been one of my favorite photographers since I really got into skateboarding around 2004. And if you're a skateboarder, you've without a doubt seen tons of Mike's work all over the place. And over the last few years, just through mutual friends, uh, I've gotten to know Mike a little bit and talked to him quite a bit. And I've wanted to have him here on the channel for a while. And we sat down the other day, recorded a call. We barely scratched the surface. We're already planning on doing part two of this. So there's a lot to get into, but I'm excited for you guys to hear this conversation. Big thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. I'll tell you more about them in a little bit and how you can save some money. But for now, let's dive into my conversation with Mike Blayback. It's clear, I think, for anyone who knows your work, it's clear that you're most known for your decades of photographing skateboarding. Uh, but I know, especially now, you're shooting a lot more than just that outside of skateboarding, and I'm excited to dive into all of that with you. But I guess just for starters, for anyone who isn't already familiar with your work, how did you find photography? Where did it kind of come into your life? And was that before or after skateboarding? Like the chicken or the egg, which one came first for you? Photography came first, but on a lower level. I think that... Um you know, as soon as I saw skateboarding and I saw like how it was photographed and how it was captured in magazines, then like a giant light bulb went off. I was like, wow, like this is, this is really exciting. Like, I, I can't believe that, you know, it was the first time I'd ever seen fisheye lenses and like people leaving flashes in the frame and like dragging the shutter and doing all these like really creative things, you know, there were no rails on it whatsoever. And that to me, like, that was the most exciting thing so that when I saw that then I like really dove into photography you know as I as I got in you know became more and more of a skateboarder it, they were very aligned the skateboarding and photography for sure and was this I know you're originally from Ohio was this while you were in Ohio was this after you had moved around what what time frame was this for you so when I was grew up in Ohio, I was interested in photography ever since I was like a little kid. I mean, I remember taking a 110 camera on a, on a, on a kindergarten trip and like, like literally one of my first memories was like using three cartridges of like crappy little film. And so I was always into photography, but I moved to Michigan when I was about 10 years old and then that's when I first got introduced to, to skateboarding. And then, you know, I, I got a camera, I got a dark room, I was like, in it, you know, so that, that's sort of the timeline for me. When, when you kind of just dove in and were just, you know, off and running with it, how early on did the idea of, oh, I can actually do this professionally, or this could possibly even become a career? Did that, was that like a goal of yours in mind? Or was it just sort of a natural occurrence from, you know, dedicating all the time into it? Maybe a little bit of both. I never droned on it. I was never like, oh, I'm going to absolutely do this. I kind of just, I sort of just knew it was a, it was a real mellow thing. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I remember when I was a kid studying like in school, I mean, like when I was in eighth grade, I, I wrote, you know, Grant Britton a letter about how to become a photographer. And, you know, I, I wrote Lance Mountain. Um, I wrote people, you know, literally when I was like a kid in middle school. And so, you know, it was always some, a goal of mine, but I, I was, you know, I, I didn't really know how to do it. You know, I just sort of fell into it. Um, very naturally through skateboarding, thankfully. And I remember going to Lansing Community College to because, you know, I'm like, oh, well, maybe I can go to Brooks or something and, you know, really study photography in Santa Barbara. But I, I couldn't afford that. My, my family couldn't afford to send me to California to like go to photo school. So I went to community college and I'd already had a dark room for a number of years and, you know, like, was processing and printing and, and I wanted to test past, you know, a bunch of courses and, and they just, they wouldn't allow that. They're like, you have to, you have to learn our way. And I was like, but there's so many different ways to do everything, you know, like the true skateboarder in me. <laughs> so like, but wait, like you can do this any way you want. And they're like, nope, like, you know, you got to learn how to like, 
process film. And so literally it was like a class. I, I was like, okay, they kind of browbeat me in the starting and it was a class like how, how a camera works. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, you know, I, I can't do this. Like, so I, I literally went to the counselor's office or whatever it was at the, at the school and I, I got my money back. And I used that money that I was gonna spend to go to college, to drive to California, to skate for the summer. And that's when, you know, I, I met all the pros in the city and befriended all of them. And, you know, after a while they were like, well, why don't you just take photos of, of me and, or us? And uh, so I did. And then I called Grant. I was like, hey dude, <laughs> I've been writing you letters since middle school. And he sent, yeah, he sent me a brick of film and then I got a retainer and I, I was working at the Gap at the time um in the warehouse folding shirts and so I, I quit my job and just started started shooting photos for a living and that was in it was 30 years ago it was in 1994. when i started i was like man like so i'm getting literally paid to hang out with my friends and 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 shoot photos like two things that i really love doing so i tried very hard like that's always been my motivation since 1994 to to keep doing that so i've always tried really hard to to create and get better and 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 have a you know the a midwest work ethic but about creativity and so i could literally afford myself to keep doing what i love doing and that's that's what i've been doing the past three decades thankfully yeah man i mean that's that's the ultimate goal i've always said to photographers like to just be well-rounded and if you can no matter what it looks like, at least for me, as long as my job and the majority of my work time is somehow revolved around photography, like I've worked other jobs. I don't want to do anything else, but just be around <laughs> photography. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. matter what it looks like. As long as I'm doing what I enjoy doing, it beats anything else out there. You know, work is work, but yeah. you know, things could obviously be a lot worse. Uh, who were some Absolutely. of the skaters that you were mostly working with, like in the early days? Uh, when I when I first moved to San Francisco, uh, Carl Watson was the first person that came up to me. You know, he was sort of like he greeted everyone at Embarcadero, and he was like, "What's up, man? Who are you?" And I'm like, "I don't know, just some kid from Michigan." And you know, because he had seen me skating there all the time. You know, I just skated by myself. I kind of kept to myself. I, you know, I, I'd been there. I sort of knew the rules and the pecking order that was Embarcadero. So that's why I didn't bring my camera because I knew I wouldn't keep my camera for too much longer. I'd probably get robbed. And, uh, you know, so Carl introduced me to Aaron Meza and Scott Johnston and Mike Carroll and Chico. And, you know, so I, I kind of just started skating with all those guys and then met everyone in the city. You know, like I met Huff through Scott and you know, just kind of started skating with everyone, you know, and then I remember Mesa brought me to Deluxe, brought me to Slap, you know, like introduced me to everyone at Thrasher, like, and kind of just, you know, at every step of the way was just like thankful because, you know, they're all amazing, like really cool people. And so, you know, I'm like, wow, I'm like, I literally have the opportunity to create the same things that I've been tearing out of taping to my wall as a kid like this is so dope you know like I, it was it was such an awesome thing so again like just you know like going out skating every day and you know trying to take photos as best I could and you know rushing to the lab to pick up all my slide film to you know look at it through a loop and so it was just like it was so much fun like yeah, man. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of those photos, like you'd seen the magazines that you'd be taping up, you mentioned Grant Britton. Was Grant one of the, I guess, biggest influences, like out of all the skateboarding photography that you had seen at the time, was Grant sort of that influence for you that you, you know, really kind of got you into shooting skating or at least maybe the approach to it? Absolutely. I mean, like hands down was, you know, the biggest influence on me growing up. I, I just his everything was so well done and so like I guess polished would be a good word for it you know he never like had a flash like just blowing the background or the the foreground out to bits with his you know stroke he was always very mindful about like 
exposure and composition and kind of telling a story through a photograph and you know I, i'd always been interested in photography so you know i didn't just look to skateboarding magazines i looked to books and i looked to you know other types of photography magazines so i studied you know like richard avedon's work and patrick de marchelier's work and you know grants was so much aligned with theirs even though he was shooting skateboarding because it was so like well done and and composed it just it just looked you know to me it felt similar it just felt right so he was certainly like the biggest you know influence for me and the fact that you know he would write me back when i was in eighth grade and you know send me film when i moved to san francisco and it's it's funny you talk about grant because i now live four doors down from grant so i went <laughs> i went from ohio to michigan and then from michigan to san francisco then to la then to north county san diego and then just most recently a few months ago i moved and i'm like i'm your neighbor <laughs> i'm like moved across the country and then i'm just i'm i, I told him i'm like i'm gonna be in, i'm gonna move into your house next. yeah so. just forever following grant <laughs> yeah, i great. love it man that's amazing yeah that's so cool that ties in a lot to another thing i wanted to talk about um grant very much is like a photographer's photographer and i've described you the same way the way you approach shooting skateboarding and then outside of that still within skateboarding but i've always loved your portraits of skateboarders like amongst all the skate photography i consumed from the moment i got into it your portraits have always stood out to me so much. And I was curious about that with your influences. And you mentioned Richard Avedon. Uh, what was it? Was it something like immediately that you were really drawn to uh, while you were out shooting with skaters that you were always shooting portraits as well? Did that sort of develop over time? What was, What's, you know, portraits, I guess, how big or how important is that to you? I mean, for me, they always kind of stood out in skateboarding magazines amongst like some of my favorite ads, I remember the old pal ads. I don't know if you recall those where it was like a portrait of Ray Barbie. I, I, I did my I did my homework back in the day. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And so to me, like that stood out just as much as the skating. So it was important to me. And, you know, as time went on and as, you know, people change and people's careers change and, I, you know, portraits to me became that much more important. And so... I don't know, I've always just wanted to keep getting better at portraiture the same way I was, you know, trying to get better at capturing, you know, action. And so like, I just have always wanted to try and study the, you know, portraiture and just keep practicing. And, you know, I, I still am. So <laughs> we all are. Um, but yeah, you know, portraits to me were very important for that reason. I mean, because I, I was very drawn to them the same way that I was drawn to others, people, people's work outside of skateboarding. Tell me a little bit about the time you spent in Philly and Love Park and that time in skateboarding. That's such a, so many of your pictures are like time capsules of that era. You know what I mean? For, for people on the outside looking in, that played a big role in that. Yeah. What was that like for you, the people you were shooting with? Just tell me a little bit about that time and specifically like photographing it, you know, in the moment. I mean, for me, you know, when I first started working for DC in early 1999, Ken had told me, one of the first things he told me was like, Kalis is getting a shoe and you're going to be spending a lot of time in Philly. And I was like, okay. I wasn't really sure what that meant, um, but it meant really that I was going to spend almost an entire summer, 99, 2000, pretty much a lot of 2001 as well in sleeping on Kalis and Stevie's couch and skating to love every day and hanging out and eating cheesesteaks and kicking it and just literally hanging out there. And so it was one of the first times that I, it sort of dawned on me that this was like a special time in skateboarding. And I'd seen Embarcadero kind of come and go. And I'd seen like the pier in San Francisco getting skate stopped. And I'm like, okay, like this may never, this may not be here forever. So I, I wanted to just, you know, capture, just shoot some portraits of people, specifically Kalis and Stevie, you know, because that's what I was there to do. And so it was just fun for me to kind of like go and like 
literally just hang out all day and just capture what was going on. And so I'm very thankful, I, you know, begrudgingly at, at first, I'm like, man, like, you know, I, I was like, <laughs> I gotta spend the whole summer here. My son Noah was just born. And, you know, so I would like come home for a few days or like maybe a week and like sometimes two weeks and like, you know, hang out with him and just, you know, get settled back at home. But I, I was always on a plane back to Philly. So I spent a lot of time there those summers and was there just, you know, capturing everything that was going on in Love Park. And in, in hindsight, I'm, I'm very thankful I did that 25 years ago. You mentioned Kalis, and I was curious about some of the people that you've spent the most time with, you know, and the people that have been in front of the yeah. camera the most out of all of your skateboarding career. Um, I mean, I have the book of that you did of just Kalis. You've got a whole book of just him. Do you think Kalis is maybe the one skater that you've spent the most time with or at least made the most photos of? Absolutely. I mean, you know, because... Josh is also from Michigan. He lived in Grand Rapids. So I remember he rode for 90, Kevin Staub's company. And I was just barely 16 and drove to Grand Rapids to shoot photos of him. And I think he was 14 at the time. And then when I moved to San Francisco, I walked outside of the Gap. He was literally sitting outside the door on the ground with Jamie Thomas. And I was like, what are you doing here? He's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I live here. And so like, He's like, let's shoot photos. And that's a switch crook at Mini Hubba. Yeah. Was that conversation. Later that day, I, you know, I, I you know, went home, took my khakis off, and <laughs> like went down to Mini Hubba with my Nikon F3 and you know, uh, just a flash in my hand and shot that photo of Mini Hubba. And then, you know, he was like, Oh, I think I might ride for DC. And I was like, Cool, that sounds awesome. You know, like I was in ninety eight. And then the next year I started working for DC. We started trying, you know, so it's like for, you know, literally since basically 1989, yeah. we've, I've been, you know, skating together and I've been photographing them since. So certainly Kalos. Yeah. You know, I wish I had, I wish I had them, you know, I, it was like at the time, even when I was a kid, when I was living in San Francisco, I remember like sending off photos of like, you know, amazing photos of like Lenny Kirk and people that like photos of them have aged very well. Um, and I just, you know, you, you're just like, ah, I'll always get that back. Like, you know what I mean? You never, it, when you're like 20 years old, you don't think about like, wait, what, what, like when I'm 50, I'm going to really want that piece of film back. That was like, not the thought of most 20 year olds, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, when, when I got started, man, I was, I would, shoot a roll of film, drive to the local Walgreens, drop stuff off, go back and skate at the skate park, shoot photos, or that was before we had the skate park, but always back and forth from there. And I would get back the four by six prints. Uh, sometimes I'd get the CD as well with the pictures and then the negatives that they would cut and put in the sleeves. Never kept any of the negatives from the first however many years. Cause I'm like, well, I got these prints. That's, I got a four by six. I got a CD. That's it. Couldn't tell you <laughs> where any of the CDs are. I've got most of the four by six prints, but like, that's it. I don't have negatives for yeah. years and it, it kills me. But yeah, at that time, you're not, you're not really thinking about that kind of stuff long term yet. You know? No, I mean, I have a few photos of Kalis. I, there's a, there's a target curb that we used to skate a lot. So I have a nose blunt photo of him. Uh, there's a Bob's big boy gap, a backside 180 backside grab down that. Um, you know, a few like real sketchy photos of him. I mean, the nose blunt photo is not composed too badly. Um, backside grabs another story, but you know, like I, I, a lot of like, he was just always down to go skating and he was always down for me too. He was always down to kind of just, you know, do whatever. So it, he, you know, f for me, I remember, you know, seeing, like Albert Watson and Richard Avedon's photos of like musicians, like jumping and like just doing different things. And I'm like, Oh wow. Like that's a different way to shoot a portrait. So like, that's how like the idea of shooting like a quote unquote portrait of someone doing a flat ground trick. And like with Kayla specifically, you know, I was in town filming Ken Block and we were shutting down the Bay bridge um, in 2012. And I'm like, 
dude, like, do you want to shoot? You want to shoot a portrait pushing down the Bay Bridge with no cars? And he's like, yeah, I'm down. Like, no hesitation. I'm like, I gotta pick you up at four thirty in the morning. He's like, sure, I'm down. So he's always been like down to just do anything, you know. So. That's amazing. I hope you're all enjoying the conversation so far. We still have plenty to get into. So I'm going to take a minute to pay some bills and thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. When I first launched my website, mattdayphoto.com, around 10 years ago, I decided to use Squarespace to do that, not only because it's super easy to use, but it has everything you need in one place. You browse through all of their templates to choose from, you find one that you like, and then you just start customizing it yourself. I share work from personal projects using their gallery pages. I have a sign-up form for my email newsletter where I get to share things and update all of you each month. I sell my prints, zines, photo books, everything directly through the online store, which is built into the website. All of these things, everything I do, it's all in one place thanks to Squarespace. If you feel like it might be overwhelming or just too much for you to do yourself, they have 24-7 customer service that are always available. I've used them myself plenty of times. If I can do all of this stuff entirely by myself, I'm sure you can do it too. You can try it out for yourself with a free trial at squarespace.com, but when you're ready to launch the website, go to squarespace.com slash mattday and use the code mattday at checkout. That's going to save you 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. While we're on the subject of that and, and shooting skating and everything, uh, what were some of the cameras that you were mostly using at that time? Were there specific like cameras and lens combinations that, that was just sort of your go-to? Was it always kind of evolving? What were you like? What's some of your favorite cameras to this day that, you know, you, you used a lot back then? Uh, mid, mid to late 90s was Nikon. I moved to San Francisco with a Nikon F3. Um, I then got a Nikon F4, uh, which got stolen um, in Berkeley out of a car. And then... Um, I think that was a 96 maybe, or yeah, it was around then. And then I got a Nikon F5. So the bulk of, of mid to late nineties was a Nikon F4, F5 mostly. Um, and fisheye lens, of course, to, um, Sunpack 555 potato mashers and 80 to 200 to eight. That was literally my kit was 80 to 200 to eight, a 51, four and a 16 millimeter fisheye lens and two two uh sunpack potato mashers and a quantum um transceivers you know because the the f5 synced at two fiftieth of a second and then i eventually graduated to pocket wizards i still use the same blue uh receivers that i used in like 97 i still have them still work so. That's amazing. When did you uh, yeah. start incorporating shooting like Hasselblad stuff with skating and, and I guess taking advantage of that, you know, faster sync speed? Um, you know, I, I always, I had, I moved to San Francisco with a Hasselblad too. Um, but because my kit was in a sketchy Jansport backpack with like sweatshirts like a gap sweatshirt wrapped around my my gear i didn't carry my hasselblad with me to shoot skating until a little bit later and so like portraits you know there's like um the drake jones and jamie thomas like portrait like I, that was shot with a hasselblad that i got um when i worked at ritz camera in lansing michigan and I bought it from someone they came in they're like i don't want this thing and i want the new like whatever i want an olympus stylus and i was like cool like let me take that off your hands but i remember i bought it for, for pretty cheap and uh but it you know so i i did a lot of portraiture with a hasselblad but not until um i moved to la in 1998 and that's when i really i started working for girl right away and that's when i started you know, because I was in a car and I could put my camera in the car and not like get on the Muni bus with like all my stuff just jammed into a Jansport backpack. That's when I started using Hasselblad. So, and then I, I, I actually was making, you know, enough money because there were six magazines at the time to buy a Hasselblad, a 30 millimeter fisheye lens and kind of like really start stepping my kit up. And then the next year I, you know, I started working for DC and, so a lot of the like, you know, I remember going 
you know, to the super ramp with Danny and, you know, having a, a sun pack potato masher, like linked onto my, you know, um, 503 CW with a 30 millimeter fisheye lens. And it was like such a dope, like kit for shooting skating. And so that's when I really started like shooting a ton of, of Hasselblad skating photos, fo- skate photos. Yeah. During that time, like early on when digital cameras started becoming a lot more common and especially just the idea of transitioning from being so used to using film cameras to digital when shooting skating. I mean, how many rolls of film had you been regularly, you know, shooting that just, it was all misses, no makes on an entire roll. And it's like, okay, nothing on that roll, nothing on that roll to be able to switch (laughs) into something like a digital kit, as well as just like the workflow. What was that like? Were you like hesitant to kind of, jump into digital at the time while things were you know it was so new and just not what you were used to i was wildly hesitant um i don't like change especially not when it comes to something like creative like i get a camera in my hand and i get a feel for it and it's just a tool that i'm familiar with and therefore i i don't like change and it's funny you mentioned film because you know i had the luxury of working for dc um and so my film bill was thousands of dollars a month like it was just my processing bill was about three thousand a month and i i i mean film was quite a bit cheaper then but i remember danny one time because he would he would skate you know while we were filming the dc video he would skate for like six hour sessions and i'd be shooting sequences of them the entire time with tmax 3200 literally just there would be piles of film at my feet and one time i remember i I ran out of film after about a hundred rolls and he was like dude you should always have at least a thousand rolls of film at at the ramp and i was like that's like six g's like and he's like so who cares and i'm like okay so i remember buying like bricks and bricks and bricks of film like i always had at least a few hundred rolls at a time. And so I was, I was going through quite a bit, especially shooting sequences. Um, and I had a dark room at the, at the ramp. So even if I was out street skating, but specifically at the ramp, if someone got a trick and I would just go right into the dark room and process the film so we could check out the sequence and look at it right away. Um, but digital, the first time I ever truly had to shoot digital was when Danny jumped over the Great Wall of China in 2005. And because they had a car waiting for me to take me to like a press box or agency or whatever to upload my photos immediately. And I I fought it tooth and nail. I was like, nope, I want to shoot it on slide film. Like, this is what I want to do. And they're like, finally, it was like, Cause they were like, you have to do that. This is what, we, this is all like lined up. And I'm like, nope, not going to do it. And <laughs> so finally they were like, cool, you're not going in. And I was like, okay, buy me. I think it was a Nikon D2X um, was the best. It was about a 13 megapixel camera. And they're like, okay, we'll buy you the camera, but you have to use that exclusively. Yeah, I, I don't, don't be pulling out like <laughs> some slide film on us. And so I remember I brought a film camera, you know, because I had this fantasy of doing this, you know, uh, but I, I, I didn't. I wanted to. I'm always a fan of doing one thing very well. So that was when I switched. And I remember the next day it was. It was one of the most looked at or viewed photos on Google. And I was like, oh, like, I guess there is like, you know, a reason for doing this because you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I assisted a wedding photographer and I remember we would shoot photos at the wedding and I would process and mount slides at the church, like at a sink. And we would show a slideshow and it would blow people's minds, you know, because you're not used to being able to snap a photo and see it at the reception. And so 
you know, I even had this fantasy of like, oh, well, maybe I can just go and like process the slide film and mount it right away. Because I did that when I was a kid, you know, I did that when I was like 16, 17 years old. Uh, but they were like not having it. They were like, no, it has to be immediate. And so that was the first time that I'd ever really truly dawned on me. And I, and at that point, I knew that was going to be more or less the quote unquote future of like how workflow is typically going to go. So I went all in, you know, on that. And that was in 2005. I, so I had a Nikon D2X. I still carried my Hasselblad with me quite a bit to shoot film, but it, it, it quickly weaned off. And then around 2008, I got a digital Hasselblad and then kind of went, went from there, but now I'm shooting film again. So, <laughs> so there you go. I was, I was going to ask about that. I know, um, over the last probably a year at least or so, we've talked a lot about different Leica cameras and lenses and things, and we like to nerd yes. out on all of that stuff. Uh, what's your, yes. what's your kind of go-to kit looking like these days, all these years later? Um, well, it's, I have an M6 and I like M6 and then I have a 35 Sumalux. And then I have a 50 millimeter Sumalux, which is what I use mostly when I'm shooting film. Um, my kit has gone to full Leica. Um, I just got an SL3. Um, and for lighting, I use pro photo lighting. So I got the transmitter like we were texting about the other day because um, it syncs at all speeds. So if I do want to shoot skating, you know, I can do it with that. So it's all switched over to Leica, which it, it's it's been tough for me because... Leica sent me, I just went to Australia for a month and they sent me an SL2 to use uh, for the month. And it was, it was, it was tough because it was the first mirrorless camera that I'd ever used. So switching back and forth between, you know, having the viewfinder and the eyepiece, it was like bugging me out because I'd always used some form of an SLR, you know, even professionally, even if it was like a, you know, a, a DSLR. So it's the first time using a mirrorless camera. So I'm getting used to it now. Like I, I just shot a, like a concert the other night for fun with this, just so I can get used to like, just really truly like having to use it on the fly. So because using it in the studio is one thing, but using like shooting a concert or, you know, shooting skating or something like that, you, you have to really kind of know, you know, know the camera inside and out. So yeah, a lot of variables there, things that can change on the fly for sure. Uh, Mentioning yeah. the studio, though, I was wanting to talk a little bit about this as well, because this is obviously a big part of what you do nowadays. Um, a lot of people probably aren't aware that Andrew Huberman is he's one of us. He's a skater. And so through <laughs> Huberman is. Lab and, you know, you doing the photos for Huberman Lab, uh, motion clubhouse shout out chris shout out morton uh those guys doing the yeah. video and everything <laughs> like andrew yeah, has built this team of people previously working you know in skateboarding and i believe all three of you guys work together at dc and now the we three of that. you working on the huberman lab stuff what is that like for you guys in terms of that sort of team effort all coming from a skateboarding background, Andrew himself, I've heard him say like, if these guys weren't behind me doing all of this, handling the video, handling the photo, like I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I know you played a big role in kind of getting that thing going. So tell me a little bit about how you found yourself, you know, involved in Huberman lab and, and what it's been like, you know, so far. I mean, it's been incredible. It's been a pretty wild ride for all of us. I met Andrew at Jacob Rosenberg's house in July of 2019. And he, you know, we just started chatting. And I was like, you know, you seem smart. Like, what? <laughs> how do I get healthy? And he like, kind of gave me some tips. And I, I followed them. And, you know, we kind of stayed in touch. And through the pandemic, we became you know, pretty close friends. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember he would come down to my house sometimes, or I'd go up to his cause he moved to LA because he wasn't teaching in person due to the pandemic. And, you know, he just kind of wanted to get out of the Bay area and move to Topanga and, you know, it was like a real peaceful place. And, and so we just, we, we started hanging out a lot. And I remember towards the end of 2020, he was like, 
I want to do a podcast. And I was like, why in the world would you want to do that? You run a lab at Stanford. You're like, you just got a book deal. You seem like a busy dude. Like, why do you want a podcast? And so, you know, he, he, he really wanted to help people sh by sharing all the information that he had access to. You know, he, he was like, no one, you know, no one has access to everything that, you know, that, that he studies and, you know, knows. And, you know, he's like a government certainly not doing it. You know, traditional media is certainly not doing it. it. It's they're not reporting things accurately. So, you know, he's like all of my colleagues and these amazing people. And I remember being like so passionate about it, telling me he's like, they do all these incredible things and discover all this amazing stuff, but published in journals, then we review it amongst ourselves. And like, maybe, like maybe the New York times might report on it, but like, they're going to get it half wrong by the time it like meets, you know, like goes through all those different channels. And so he's like, I want to just share all this information directly with people. And so he's very, very passionate about it. So I'm like, all right, sure. Like, I'll, I'll, help you what do you need and he's like well like can you help me like what it looks like and I'm like yeah sure you know like I'd spent you know the last 25 plus years like making stuff for skateboarders that hate everything so it was amazing to you know I'm like yeah sure I can do that that's that's kind of what I've been doing you know in addition to shooting photos and so we shot the portrait in front of my daughter's bedroom door like I remember we had the conversation and the first portraits of him, he was wearing this like blue shirt. He's going to be pissed for me <laughs> saying this, but it was like way too small. Like it was insane because he's kind of like a buff dude. And like the buttons were like pulling <laughs> apart. And I was like, hey, dude, like this isn't going to cut it, man. Like you got to actually like get a shirt that fits you, first of all. And I remember like, you know, I shooting black and white photos for me, I always tell people to wear black you know, because of the contrast, especially with a white backdrop, because your eye goes straight to their face and straight into their eyes. And so that's kind of where the black shirt came from. And then from there, kind of like, well, you know, it would be silly if we had a studio with a bunch of like, you know, smoking, like, whatever beakers in the background, like, people should just be paying attention to what you're saying. So that's where the look of the podcast came to be as well. So we shot portraits, he came, he came back with a black shirt and then um, the fit. And so we shot the portraits in front of my, my daughter's bedroom door and we recorded the audio in my bathroom. And I, I tapped into another friend from skateboarding, Brian Thompson, who used to, I used to work with at DC. Like we literally laid out like Stevie's first shoe ad together. And, you know, I'd had some, some, some tear sheets from like different ads and I'm like hey what if we make the logo like this and, you know from the you know for many years obviously like Ken's look of black and white photography with color text or like a color product shot was so powerful so you know I'm like black and white photo blue text because we didn't want it to be very Stanford looking you know so we did um it was a blue text and we kind of did everything. So even, you know, the look and feel of it, um, the person that ha uh, helped me with all that, he also came from skateboarding. So we, we kind of did everything and just put it out there. We, we essentially filmed um, the first episode um, in Andrew's, what essentially was a closet. And Chris and Martin, I remember I called them and helped them. They helped me, you know, because I, I didn't, I mostly use strobes, you know, I didn't use a lot of continuous lighting. And so I remember asking Martin, like, Hey, what's, what's the best lighting? Like, I want the, you know, the light to look like this and be like this. And he kind of showed me and I remember FaceTiming him in Andrew's basement and kind of set everything up. And so that, that's how it started. And I, I didn't really realize how popular it was until the end of 2021, because we launched the podcast in January of 2021. And by the end of that year, I remember Andrew calling me and being like, Hey, we should probably lean into this a little bit more. And I was like, I guess maybe we should. And you know, cause at the time I was doing, I still work for DC and I was doing a lot of commercial work at that point. I did a lot of, 
you know, jobs for Ford and, uh, you know, Honeywell or whomever, like I was just doing commercial photography, like a lot, like pretty much full time. And so as the podcast grew, I kind of dovetailed my career into, into doing that mostly. So, you know, it's fun for me to do all the portraiture because we have such amazing guests. And for me, you know, people like Rick Rubin or David Goggins and plus, you know, like all the scientists and all the people that are just doing all this like incredible stuff to help humanity. It's like fun for me to, to make like real portraits of them. Um, you know, it's probably a little bit overkill that I'm using a 90 Summicron and a Leica SL3 for a YouTube uh, thumbnail cover, but we are, you know, I'm sure we'll make a book eventually. And <laughs> we do need to use the photos for outside of that, but so, hey, yeah. man, if you've got it, <laughs> use it. Yeah. It's fun. You know, cause like Rob Moore and Ian Mackey are two of the other partners in the podcast that, you know, Rob was started with Andrew. I mean, I, I came in after Rob even, and then we brought Ian on. So, but Rob and Ian don't skate, barely know what a skateboard looks like. But aside from that, our entire crew of like core group of people, all are skateboarders. And it's like, for me, it's like, it's such an awesome thing. I remember when we started and it was funny cause Rob will probably be pissed at me for saying this, but he showed up with like two dad cams and like an Erewhon bag to like do the first episode. And I'm like, dude, like, what are you doing? And he's like, I don't want this to be like overproduced. And, you know, he was talking about podcasts where they have like sound effects and there's a crew of like 60 people in the credits after you listen to the, to listen to it. And, um, you know, and I'm like, but there's a difference between like actually like being like clear and polished, but you know, what's funny is we still use those, those two dad cams to do the solo episodes. Really? Still to this day, you know, lighting is better. And we, we, we made the switch. We've switched them over to 4k, <laughs> but you know, we still use those same cameras because you know, it's about the conversation and the information. Most of our audience listens to them. Uh, you know, I do think that we're going to switch the cameras out pretty soon. <laughs> Chris and Chris and Martin have been dying to do that as well. I can imagine. <laughs> so it's, it's dope that, you know, when we need to do something, we're like, okay, cool. Like, we're just going to do it and we'll figure it out. And because we've been doing that our whole careers through skateboarding, like, oh, I got to do something. Like, cool, I'm going to climb over a fence and I'm going to figure out how to light it. I'm going to do it and I'm going to walk away from this and like have something that's good enough for the cover of a magazine. You know, that same mindset that we apply to, to doing the podcast, we can keep like a very small group of people and still do things at, at a high enough level to where our audience, you know, still, still loves it. Yeah, man. That's that, you know, the DIY kind of attitude, the problem solving <laughs> of all of it, you know, it's like you, you yes. find a way, you figure out a way, whatever that looks like. Um, it's so cool to hear, man. Everything that I see you shooting now and again with Martin and Chris, like it's, it's cool to see that kind of stuff completely outside of skateboarding but it still it still has that same feel to it man so uh yeah just super excited for you guys man it's amazing it's a lot of fun for me and i mean again like when i when we very when we started the podcast i remember thinking like man it would be so cool if like i could work with chris or and you know work with chris and martin and like be able to like you know because rob rob's gnarly i mean he he would film edit the episodes, negotiate all our advertising. Like he, he did so much and I'm like, man, you're gnarly. Like, and he, he just, I remember him like wanting to just do like everything, you know? And, and I was like, you know, like I got these guys, like they could probably help out with this. And I remember hitting up Chris and I'm like, Hey, this might be beneath you, but like, do you think you can cut the clips for us? And he's like, yeah, sure. Like, you know, and then, they eventually like lit an episode and then they filmed an episode and then they like started editing the episodes and now they kind of do all like most all things video related um because we've just grown so much and it's like we got a lot going on so it's like um th those guys are amazing to work with and the whole you know again the skateboarding mindset of it is is awesome and feels feels very good to me 
Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, it's a it's a full circle kind of thing, you know. It's it's awesome to <laughs> all these years yeah, later, no, and it's very like, thankful. It's yeah, it's great to see, man. Thank you so much for for taking the time and and sharing everything, dude. I really appreciate it, and uh, you know, hopefully, this isn't the last time we can hop on a call, record one of these, because I know people will enjoy this one, and uh, yeah, just excited to see everything you're doing, man. Well, thank you, dude. I mean, it's. You know, maybe one of these days we'll have to get on another call and like really nerd out. Yeah. I mean, I know that's what your channel is kind of all about. So, <laughs> you know, start talking D76 and one to one or maybe not and that kind of thing. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to do that as well. Absolutely, dude. I'm, I'm totally up for that. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it again soon sometime. But uh, yeah, thank you again, man. I really appreciate it. I really hope you all enjoyed this conversation with Mike. It's always a good time talking to him. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video and, you know, towards the end of the call, we're already planning on doing a second episode that's going to be a little bit more gear heavy and kind of nerding out on photography, technical things. Uh, but I really wanted to just introduce him on the channel and just get more of his story and his whole, you know, career as he got into skateboarding photography and where he is today. So Hope you all enjoyed that one. Uh, if you have any questions for Mike, maybe we'll pull some questions from the comments of this video in our part two. So if you have any questions for him, anything you want us to talk about in the next video, leave them in the comments down below. But that's all for today. Thank you all for watching. I love you guys, and I'll see you soon.